afternoon and welcome to 3 Talk with me, Nolene. Women in science have been making contributions for centuries, but for the most part receive little or no recognition for their work. We very rarely stop to think about the people behind the microscopes who work so tirelessly to help us cure the incurable or the social scientists who observe endlessly so that we can learn and evolve. The Department of Science and Technology hosted a special awards evening this past Friday to give recognition to the women in the sciences who are making outstanding contributions. This afternoon I have a group of remarkable women in studio including a minister, seven professors and four young women who are making their mark in the field. First up to tell us more about Women in Science Awards, please welcome Minister Naledi Pando. Thank you so much Minister for coming in. So tell me about the, uh, the award ceremony. Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, the uh, awards are uh, dedicated toward uh, acknowledging uh, women in science, uh, women who are making uh, uh, remarkable contributions to the development of knowledge, uh, both in South Africa and in the world, mm. uh, as well as uh, uh, women who have a, a, a history of contribution in the many dimensions of achievement uh, in science. Mm. So it's really uh, both recognition as well as encouragement. Almost like hats off. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very Saying, much. you know, well done. Yeah. Uh, you're certainly of, you know, world standard and we should celebrate mm. you. Mm. Because uh, would you agree with what I just said that for centuries women have made contributions but very little accolades, very little recognition for, for the work that they do? Well, certainly uh, uh, women have been making a contribution for many centuries. Uh, this year is the International Year of Chemistry mm. uh, as uh, recognized by the United Nations. And one of the uh, renowned women that we remember in this year is Marie Curie, mm. who of course is uh, one of the rare uh, women who received two Nobel Prizes mm. for science. Mm. So there are women uh, who are outstanding uh, in the contribution that mm. they've made uh, to the world. And what we are really trying to encourage in South Africa is recognition of women scientists in South Africa and also the emergence of young scientists because we want to see more and more mm. women enter the fields of science. Mm. Now all I can think of, you've just mentioned Curie, and all I can think of is the next Nobel Peace Prize winner for science would come from South Africa. Because ultimately, <coughs> that, that is something that I see a little smile on your face. Oh, well, this is that our ambition. The, that know? would be the best, it's, wouldn't it's it? It's our ambition. And among uh, some of the guests you will have today, I believe we have persons who really are doing work that is of a level mm. uh, that I believe will merit Tell uh, me about uh, such Tell me award. about the women. Well, what, some of the uh, work, as you know, we have uh, this terrible disease burden, both in South Africa but on the African continent as mm. well. Mm. We have the HIV AIDS pandemic, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, mm. uh, several uh, diseases that pose a massive challenge mm. in terms of diagnosis, of treatment, uh, of protection. Mm. And I think some of the research we're beginning to see in response to HIV and AIDS, uh, one has the Caprisa study in mind, for mm. example, mm. where a consortium of institutions and scientists have come together mm. to see whether we can empower women mm. to protect themselves in preventing infection of this terrible disease. And I think studies such as that, that are looking at microbicide gels, mm. uh, diagnostic tools being developed where we are able to uh, uh, detect uh, tuberculosis mm. uh, infection at a very early stage and through simple uh, uh, means, very important, mm. uh, being able to detect the presence of cancer using sensors, so, mm. so mm. many uh, uh, endeavors uh, mm. by women, which I believe will make a real difference in our is, society. Is enough money being put into research, into, you know, because in order for us to, to reach the Nobel Peace Prize uh, categories, we really have to put a lot of money in research. And, you know, first world <coughs> countries are doing that. They are leading, uh, the, 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 for, they are in the forefront of, of research and development. Are we, are we getting there or, or obviously because of a whole lot of other things, we can't be in the forefront. Well, we have to be because knowledge is the future. I think uh, we must increase our investment in science, in technology, and in innovation. Mm. South Africa has begun to improve. 
We're not there yet. Mm. Uh, most countries uh, uh, have said at the minimum we should be at 1% of GDP. Mm. We're at about 0.93%. Okay. Okay. So we're, we're, we're moving up. Yeah. But Rwanda is beyond 1%, a small country, but investing mm. very heavily uh, in science uh, uh, and technology. Mm. So I think we need to do more. Yeah. Uh, but we have begun to see significant improvement, and that is positive. But there's no minister, I think, in any government will tell you they have enough funding in their particular yes, sector. Obviously. We would like to see yeah. uh, much more investment, especially uh, in supporting our senior researchers so that they can take on mm -hmm. more young people and, and assist us uh, in preparing them for future research careers. Mm. How do we make science <coughs> and technology uh, that the ordinary person, the ordinary man in the street, can understand the importance, the value of it. I was talking to someone and say, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, women in science. And he rolled his eyes and said, oh, that's so boring. And I'm, but I'm thinking this is critical for the future of our country. So, you know, how do we make it accessible, uh, understandable to everybody and that nobody just thinks, oh, my goodness, you know, it's just for a certain sector? Well, remind him that uh, next time he has a big meal and feels rather uncomfortable, when he seeks a remedy, who developed it? It's scientists. Mm. Uh, next time he has to go and establish whether he has some particular illness mm. and mm. needs to be tested, who's mm. developing those diagnostic tools? Yeah. It's scientists. Yeah. Um, there is so much science. It's every day. It's all around us. Mm. Uh, mm. When we measure... Uh, we're using scientifically developed instruments. Uh, as you seek to put different ingredients in your meal, mm -hmm. making sure you get the right ingredients. And so all of this is really scientific. Your cell phone, as your Twitter, mm. uh, uh, the, all the aspects that have been developed, mm. your Facebook via mobile technology, now TV, mm. moving to digital uh, uh, as we change from uh, analog. All of these mm. are scientific developments. Yeah. So yeah. science is all around it's us. It's all around the us. The different textiles we're using, mm. uh, uh, you Some, know, new materials. Someone sat in their so lab for many, for hours many To make hour. sure, one, that whatever mm. we use is safe, two, that it works, mm. and three, that it really is different from what we had before. Yeah, and, and you know, at the launch of the National Science Week a few weeks ago, you said that social and <coughs> economic development is dependent on science and technology. So, some of what you've already already covered, but, I mean, how, again, do, do we make people understand that the, what you said what, it affects us on a daily basis? Well, we, we're working very hard to try and encourage people to recognize that investment in research and development, and hence in science and technology, can make a massive contribution to growth in South Africa. I just mentioned the development of solar energy in China. Mm. Millions of jobs have been created mm. through that. Mm. South Africa has hundreds of days of sun, but hardly has any solar mm. uh, technology mm. in use in the country. Uh, so there are opportunities for our economy, where new players can come into uh, uh, the economic sphere, where new products will be developed. Uh, if we look at uh, addressing the demand side of our use of energy, mm. if we had sensors being used in all buildings in South Africa so that when you leave a room, the lights go off. Mm. These are new technologies, these are new business opportunities, these are contributions to the economy. Mm. What are some of the major challenges or even barriers to entry for young South African women who want to go into the science and technology field? I think uh, 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 there are uh, perhaps three. The first is uh, that science is not seen as a traditional uh, uh, career or academic path uh, for young women. They mm. tend to be sort of put off uh, science and the images we have of persons who work in the science and technology sphere tend to be male images mm. and not female. So we need to change the mindset and present new role models for young women so that it's natural mm. for them to choose to enter these fields. Mm. Secondly, I think the question of resources. We must make uh, awards and scholarships available so that more and more young women can easily enter uh, mm. the fields. And I think uh, what we're doing through the Science Awards is very important in recognizing uh, women scientists who are experienced scientists. Because mm. the issue of mentors and role models 
is uh, very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I think a fourth element is we must always ensure that people have the infrastructure to do their work. Because mm. if you don't have good laboratories, if you don't have adequate equipment, it's very difficult to actually achieve what you want to. Mm. As I say goodbye to you, one, uh, your daughter is, is one of the people I'll be interviewing today. She was one of the people that were recognized at, uh, at the award ceremony. How does that make you feel? Well, I'm very proud of her. It was quite a surprise for me. Uh, but uh, she's a deserving candidate, I'm told, by uh, uh, the judges who were involved because I said, it's my daughter, you know, yeah. and you know how we all are. Yes. But uh, she's uh, following her studies, almost complete now, yeah. with her PhD, so it'll be very nice. Fantastic. Uh, and so we're proud to have a how future Dr. Pando in the oh, family. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and how do you play that, you know, minister and proud mummy? Because it could be quite difficult sometimes. Yeah, yeah it can be. Uh, but, you know, uh, colleagues have said to me, look, your daughter's achieving on her merits. Don't make it uncomfortable for her. Recognize her success and let her enjoy what she's achieved. I've enjoyed speaking to you, Thank Minister. You Thank you so much, much for Thank joining you. us. Do you work in the sciences or are you thinking of entering the field? Give us a call on 86 or tweet me. My username is Nolene3talk. After the break, I'll be chatting to three of the women who have been recognized as distinguished women in science. Welcome back to 3 Talk. Today we're meeting remarkable women working in the sciences. Please welcome Professors Maureen Kutzer, Kuresha Abdul Karim, and Aimee Vivian Stewart. Thank you so much, uh, ladies, for coming in. How does it feel to be recognized, Aimee, uh, for, for the work that you do? Because that is what happened on Friday last week. It was a wonderful recognition. And I think that one works very hard over very many years. And to actually have that public acknowledgement of what we've been trying to achieve yeah. was really, was fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Kirisha? Uh, like Amy, it was an amazing experience. I felt uh, deeply honored and privileged uh, and also felt a sense of reward that many years of work was being recognized in this way. Because mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't happen, it hasn't happened before, has it, that women in science are, are, are recognized or, or am I missing something? Has it happened before? Well, the awards have been going on for some years. Okay. So, so, so oh, right. So it's not something that has just started. It's been happening no. for, for a while. What yes. is it that you love about, about the sciences? Well, I got into science quite by accident. Um, I was in the medical <coughs> technology sec sector and went up to Zanin to the Malaria Institute looking for a job in parasitology. Mm. And when I got there, they said, no, you must go into entomology. And I said, what's that? You know, oh, it's about insects. And I said, well, I don't even know an insect's got six legs. <laughs> and that's how I started in science. I mean, it's really weird, but anyway, here I am. So this is not what you wanted to do when you grew up? Well, I kind of didn't have any passion in my life, and it's grown on me. Yeah. You know, so okay, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic, because you've been, we're going to talk about what you've been doing, because you've been studying mosquitoes for, what, 30 years? Something like that. 30 years. I think, that, I think that is amazing. You'll tell us what you've been, what you've been doing. Is this, is this something you've always wanted to do, uh, Kuresha? Absolutely. I always knew I wanted to be a scientist. And um, I started off life, although I'm a scientist for about 30 years, uh, I've uh, uh, studied different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So initially I did biochemistry and then didn't like uh, being in the lab under the microscope and decided to study epidemiology. Okay. And epidemiology deals with populations, large groups of people, and understanding issues that have large public benefit. And uh, so the science and my interest in, in the society was able to have a good marriage. <laughs> okay. All right. Explain what you do, Amy. Well, what I do is we, we've been trying to develop programs for people with chronic diseases and disability mm. and specifically in the poorer socio-economic groups in South Africa, particularly those who use the public health care sector. And we're trying to develop appropriate rehabilitation mm. so that it's effective, um, involves the family and actually ensures that people get back to the kind of 
functional and mobility levels that they potentially are capable of doing mm. and that we can try and get the best quality of life yeah. um, for them regardless of what the um, end um, disability uh, level is or, or whatever. Yeah. 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 All right. And, and Kiresha, you, you've been involved, uh, you were in Vienna last year, but after many, many years of, of working, uh, groundbreaking research and outcome in the HIV field. Tell us about that. Yeah. So um, before I tell you about the microbicides and, and the results, I want to underscore your prefacing comments, which is it's a long, hard journey. Mm. And science is something we have to invest in. You don't find solutions overnight. Mm. So about 20 years ago, when we did our first population-based studies to um, quantify uh, and understand the spread of HIV, we found that women had about three times more infection than men. Mm. And women acquired infection at a much earlier age compared to men. Mm. So that immediately set off a whole series of questions in my head to try and understand why do women have more infection? Mm. And in the course of that, we uh, also learned about the limitations of abstinence, behavior change, and condom use for women. So if you have to take all of that, particularly for young women, we're really leaving them with no option to control their own ability to protect themselves from mm. getting HIV. So that led to a series of trials to find a microbicide, which is a chemical, a product that's inserted into the general tract and uh, trying to find one that prevents infection. Mm -hmm. So the results last year of the Caprisa 004 trial uh, tested an antiretroviral agent in a gel formulation. And for the first time, we were able to demonstrate that a microbicide could prevent HIV infection. And, and from there, because you went to present in Vienna, what has happened? Because it's almost a year since you, you did your presentation in Vienna. So lots has happened since then. Um, the, the really important piece was the overwhelming response to this finding. It really energized the HIV prevention field, which up to, although sexual prevention uh, and transmission is the most dominant form of uh, spread of HIV, we have not in the 30 years since the first cases of AIDS had a lot of success mm. in finding ways to prevent infection. This actually marked one of several studies that rapidly followed, all consolidating around the use of antiretrovirals to prevent infection. But the piece around the use of tenofovir gel, there are two other trials uh, that, are, uh, ab uh, that uh, are, are confirming these results in a way. And that's important because when you have a, fi a scientific finding, one finding is not sufficient. You need to have other trials confirming that. Mm. So that's underway. One of, the, uh, one of the studies is funded by the National Institutes of Health, and the other is funded by the Department of Science and Technology mm -hmm. and by the US government. Uh, that in itself is new and novel and very exciting. Um, there's a lot. Uh, one of the things that we also need to do is get the product license. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, it's an experimental drug. It can only be accessed under research conditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, technical arm of uh, DST, uh, Technical Innovation Agency, is working very hard with some uh, p private sector partners to get the product licensed and manufactured. The plant for manufacturing has been secured and some of the tech transfer from the US to here. That's very exciting again for the first time the South African government holds royalty-free license to produce this drug, which means we don't have to wait uh, very long after licensure mm. for the public to benefit from this product. Mm. Uh, and, and again, uh, acknowledging DST's investment in ensuring manufacture happens and then distribution. So there are also studies that are underway to look at how do we introduce this new product into the public sector. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I think there will be a lot of guidelines that would need to be established. Uh, this is a drug. How do we dispense this to the public and so forth? Right. So lots going on. Lots of Watch the space. So exciting. <laughs> I will be watching this space. Very, very exciting. Voyo in Secunda, welcome to 3Talk. Hi, Nalin. How are you? I'm very well. Could you speak up a tad? Sure. Um, I just want to make a comment yes. and um, yeah, I was listening to your guests and I'm also a woman mm -hmm. who is in the medical sciences field mm 
Mm -hmm. I love, love, love my job, but unfortunately it is one of those jobs that are getting very little recognition. Yes. And for me, one of the things that I think um, is the problem, because if you look um, at medical sciences, um, especially in South Africa, there is a lot of women, uh, more than men, but it seems that men tend to get more recognition, as um, your guests have mentioned mm. earlier, actually mm. the minister. Mm. Um, I think the main problem is, like, especially with us, if you knew, because I'm only working for like five years, there is like just lack of mentorship, um, mm. there's lack of funding in terms of scholarships and yeah. bursaries for students who actually want to enter this field. Yeah. And also I thought that there's just also lack of resources, because mm. I thought if we had all those things in place because for some people you go or you you're doing a matric and you're thinking okay what am i going to do and reality is um, for most of african families you have to think of if i do choose this career is the bursary that's going to be in place for me you know mm. to go and mm. do something like that and unfortunately mm. in south africa it's mostly um careers that are not really unfortunately um for careers such as uh, engineering where you seem to find that there's like you know available scholarships and bursaries and mm. for somebody who wants to go into the medical sciences it's very very difficult yeah. i mean it's difficult yeah. to enter it's difficult also to stay within it yeah because let's, let's like leave I said, it there it's just, yeah yeah let's leave it there thank you very much i think that i think she's made some really really pertinent points because the minister was also touching on that would you like to comment on that elmer I, I, I certainly think that one of the most important things that once you get to the university and once you're actually trying to develop a research career is mentorship mm. and you know to actually have people that whom you can follow people who can help you um, decide on an appropriate career path and I think that it's very important that all of us who've sort of managed to maybe get somewhere along this long path that we actually provide the mentorship yes. and the infrastructure for our younger scientists and I think that there are a number of there are remarkable there are a remarkable number of resources and it's just really knowing how to access them mm. and how to get a situation where um, people can develop mm. um, and but I think she made she definitely made yes, a lot of yes, uh, good yes, points yes. we're gonna say goodbye to you thank you very much for joining us our lines are still open for your calls on 086 or tweet me my username is Nolene 3 talk we'll have more in a moment Welcome back to 3 Talk. Today I'm speaking to women who are making outstanding contributions to the world of science. Please welcome Professor Fumulani Malawudzi. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Before I, I, I talk to uh, you about what you do uh, specifically, how did you feel about being recognized on Friday? I felt so happy. I didn't even know what to do. Yeah. I was trembling. Because I felt that it is not my award, it's the award for nursing as a profession as well. Yeah. As nurses are never recognized. So being a nurse, being recognized and as a scientist, to me was sort of like mm. a wow. Mm. The last caller that we got, she was, she was saying that, you know, women in, in sciences, the major problem is lack of funding recognition as well as mentoring your your comments on what she said I think she's so right because honestly we do not have mentors that are able to mentor us and also to mentor those that are still coming so it's sometimes very difficult when you are in the science profession mm. to find people who will hold your hands and sort of like show you the way and yeah. the ropes yeah so issues of funding also uh, some things that are, uh, are things that are still needs to be taken care of. Mm. I'm just happy that the minister is here because sometimes we feel like those that are doing quantitative or clinical research are being recognized mm. than those that have been do doing social behavioral sciences. Mm. For example, nurses. There's no way that uh, we could continue talking about research that produces medicine without knowing the perceptions of those that will be taking those medications. Mm. So I feel that both sciences are very important. Yeah. 
All right, we'll come back and talk specifically about what you are, uh, uh, are doing. Maureen, w your comments on, on what the caller said? Well, I think that in my field there is definitely a, um, a lack of jobs out there. Um, apart from within academia, um, the medical entomologist has got very few options. Mm. Um, although South Africa is going for malaria elimination, um, and there will be a few jobs created through that, we hope, mm. Um, there, it, it's a problem. It yeah. really is a problem, and and you, young people come to you and they ask you, you know, I'm interested in insects. So you know, what career paths are there for me? Mm. And I say, well, there's academia. You can become a lecturer. And they say, well, what does that pay? <laughs> <laughs> and then they laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about pay, do scientists get paid a lot? No. No. So you <laughs> no, do it for the love of it. Basically, I think so. Well, Carisha? I think it's a relative issue. Uh, are you, if you're comparing us to like industry captains, then definitely not. But I think academics uh, earn a, a decent salary. Mm. Um, you know, uh, nobody will say more to uh, no to earning a little bit more. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I do think um, I just wanted to pick up on an issue around mentoring and opportunities uh, from um, something the minister said earlier is that we really have to invest in science and technology mm. because it's really important for transforming society and we see that repeatedly. And uh, we have to be able to find solutions to our own problems. Mm. And investments in science and technology is gonna be critically important for us to realize the dreams of this democracy. Mm. Mm. Secondly, that uh, we have wonderful partners outside the country. And I think in the, in the work we do around HIV AIDS or other diseases that are challenging us, we are really realizing the importance of partnerships to bring world-class people to work alongside us uh, as we look for solutions and also to fill some of the mentorship gaps that yeah. we have. Yeah, that's critical. That's that, absolutely critical. Uh, we, we really can't isolate ourselves. Yeah. We, we have to look at local solutions, but we have to look at how do we bring the best minds from around the world to work alongside us as we mm. find these solutions. Mm. All right, let me, let me come back to specifics again. Maureen, mm. uh, in the last segment, I was meant to ask you what it is that you do exactly, because you've been studying, and that is a very simplistic way of putting it, studying mosquitoes for the past 30 years. Yes, um, malaria, as you know, is a huge problem in Africa. Mm. Um, in South Africa, perhaps not as much as across our borders, but nevertheless, still a very serious problem, such that the Department of Health recognizes it as being worthy of putting in a considerable, considerable amount of money um, into controlling malaria. Mm. Um, and, and mosquitoes transmit malaria. Yes. So it's not just good enough to study the human side of, it, of what the parasite does to humans. One also has to look at ways of stopping people being bitten by mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. and, and the problems surrounding that whole transmission cycle mm. are becoming more and more intense because the mosquitoes are becoming resistant to insecticides, just the same as the parasites are becoming resistant to drugs. And so we are looking at way, other ways of controlling the mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, on, on this particular issue, before I forget, um, is, is mention that, that this award for me is, is, while it's hugely a great honor for me to receive it, it is for me the most, the highest recognition that my group can have. Mm. Because I didn't get here by myself. I have, I have got a whole group of stu wonderful students, great colleagues that have helped me get this award. Yeah. And so, you know, it really is, it really is a wonderful thing for the, for the whole well, of the Well group. done. So, well done to yeah, you. I just wanted okay, to uh, for Mulani, coming back to you, you've chosen indigenous knowledge systems as your, as your research focus. So yes. what, does, what exactly does that mean? Uh, indigenous knowledge systems is the science that comes, the tacit knowledge that was not tapped before, things that were not written about, mm -hmm. issues that uh, relates to the people of our own country, the problems surrounding them, issues like traditional medicines, uh -huh. which were not uh, recognized previously. Right. But with the new act, the Traditional Health Practitioner Act of 
number 22 of 2007. We are now free to start looking at the value of traditional medicine yeah. in society. Yeah. And as to how can we ensure that as modern practitioners, we can work hand in hand with traditional health mm. practitioners. And what are some of the challenges that you've come across? Uh, some of the challenges were when you started talking about indigenous knowledge. Uh, you know, we come from a history where it was viewed as barbaric. So it was still something that people didn't understand. Mm, mm. It was even difficult to get your work published, as people would think that this is not science. Mm. What are you talking about? However, when the uh, act was promulgated, it was better for us to start working. Yeah. And we are now having a lot of people who are working in that area of indigenous knowledge. And, and how do we, so when do we see all of this uh, indigenous medicine, if I can call it that, and Western medicine come, coming together? Will there come a time where we can actually see the results of what you're working on? Uh, as it is now, there are some clinics who, who have already started working with traditional healers. Yeah. There are people who are working also in, uh, uh, in collaboration in terms of uh, TB, yeah. in terms of HIV, AIDS, and, uh, and other diseases. Okay. So there is recognition malaria. of each other. And in malaria as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and even in malaria. So it has become also not something for South Africa, but internationally there is yeah. recognition of indigenous knowledge. I was also involved in a conference where we had all people from, all nurses from international countries mm. sort of looking at the tea. We had a tea house where each and every country was showing the value of tea and mm. how it contributes to healing. Okay. So, there's so the, it, it's not just a little area, it is so broad and, and affects the whole world. It affects the whole world and it's an area that I would really like to see young scientists yeah. starting to look at yeah. because like we have been told by our forefathers that you know if we talk about uh, being rich and being prog a progressive country we have to also look at our soil. Yeah. What do we have there? What do we have around us? And where do and we what come makes from? us yeah. Africans? Yeah. What gives us pride? Mm. Mm. I also looked at the philosophies that could be used in order to promote what we are studying. Yeah. So I looked at the philosophy of Ubuntu, mm. more especially in nursing, mm. as a caring ethics. Mm. How do we continue caring our people mm. if we do not have the values of Ubuntu? Yeah. which makes us human mm. and also being able to recognize patient as they mm. are mm. and where they come from. Fantastic. All of mm. you, in fact, everybody that has, uh, you know, been uh, on the show today, you know, really, really invaluable uh, uh, information that you've imparted to us. So we thank you very much for uh, joining us on 3Talk and congratulations again. We'll be back with more Women of Science just after this. You're back with Three Talk. It's Women's Month, and there is no better time to celebrate women who are achieving extraordinary things. My next guests are doing just that. Please welcome Professors Janice Limson and Pearl Sitole. Thank you, Profs, for coming in. It's Thank so you. nice Thank to you. say that to young <laughs> women, you know, Professor. Really, really nice. And well done for being recognized. How did that feel, uh, Janice? Thank you. It felt immensely gratifying to be recognized in this way. And as with all such recognition, it doesn't come by being, you know, by working alone. So it's thanks yeah. to family, um, mentors, role models, and a fantastic group of students who are hopefully working in the lab today. And, and you are here, and they're <laughs> working here. in the lab and watching this, saying, we're working and you're on free talk. <laughs> and, and for you, Paul, the I recognition? I was shocked, actually. I, was, uh, I was, because, uh, my kind of, of work is one that makes me uh, raise uncomfortable questions yeah. around uh, knowledge, even knowledge relationships, 
even the monopolization of science by the West and how we equate science with Westernness. Mm. And so I, I never actually thought that an, a, a system that is known to conventionally be pro-Western science in that way could recognize the kind of work that we do Please speak uh, English, now. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm looking very <laughs> intelligently at you and I'm thinking, did you just say? <laughs> so I understand West and 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 uh, raising uncomfortable questions. But what you No, what I was <laughs> no really. I'm serious. The kind of work that uh, uh, Professor Mlaudz was talking about here yeah. uh, today is yeah. is kind of work that has had never been recognised before. Yes. And, and so you do similar to work, uh, similar work. Sorry, yeah. to what she does. Yes. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and added to that, I also just study marginal spaces. By that I mean gender inequalities, yeah. I mean uh, the marginalization of governance systems such as traditional leadership, for example. Yes. I, I study issues related to equity, you know, uh, uh, of attention to various spaces, rural versus urban, mm. um, uh, quantitative versus qualitative research. Yeah, no, no, qualitative, <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Those kinds of things. So I was very shocked to actually be recognized. I, I thought we were not there yet, but yeah. I, I was pleasant. Why, why did you think you were not there yet, or we are not there yet? Well, I think that the systems, particularly if you go to universities today, you still find a situation where you have an African lecturer at the top of the uh, course outline and a host of uh, foreign surnames uh, that are very male and, uh, mm. and Western in the, in, the, in the reader's list. In other words, we are not yet uh, acknowledged in Africa as knowledge producers and we are actually not using our own work uh, to portray ourselves as scientists. Mm. So I actually thought that, you know, we are still struggling and uh, uh, um, for the Department of Science and Technology to start uh, raising uh, the, uh, that awareness and saying, hey, we are there as, as African uh, scientists, women in particular, mm. it mm. was fantastic. No, fantastic. And when did you tell us your love for the sciences? When, when did it all begin? One of the things that really helped is having a mother who was um, in nursing. So that was the health sciences, if you like. Mm -hmm. So through her, I started becoming a little bit more comfortable with science. You know, when I was growing up, um, back then, you could become a doctor, lawyer, or, or, or teacher. teacher. Or you know? nurse. Uh, or nurse, yes. absolutely. So once I got to university, I met some amazing women. Um, amongst those, Professor Debello Nyokong, who is perhaps hands down the most amazing scientist in Africa. And it was through that that I started developing a love for science. And I think, I think the thing that made the biggest difference was realizing that through science, we could ask difficult questions and we could answer them. Mm. So we could be doing research that could make a big, a big difference to society, to socioeconomic conditions, for example. So in my research, I think that's immensely gratifying. Yeah. And exactly what does your research entail? Our research group is involved in developing biosensors. So these are tiny little devices that we hope will be used for early disease detection. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like looking for a needle in a haystack, if you like. So looking for some kind of biomarker which might say, will give an early indication of having cancer, for example. As mm. you know, a lot of therapeutic interventions, so drugs, will obviously work better the earlier disease is, is, is detected. Mm. So our research is working at that interface. It's trying to develop sensors for early disease detection, but also looking at, at, at issues such as environmental monitoring. And, and what are these biosensors made out of? I think that... Just give us a picture I'll, of what I'll they, give you a picture yeah. right now. Um, glucose sensors used by diabetics. Okay, so I think many people will be able to relate to that. So yeah. those are tiny little sensors, um, which involves taking a little prick of blood, mm -hmm and on a tiny little strip will be some kind of molecule that will just pick up the glucose in the blood because you can imagine that there's a whole lot of other stuff in, in blood. Yeah. So just to pick up the glucose, you'd have a molecule at the, at the surface which will just detect that and yeah. give you a readout.
Okay, it sounds very simple, simple enough. Absolutely. <laughs> but it's not as simple as that. It takes years and years to actually get a product to, to, to market. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely years and years of, of lots of papers, lots of research, lots of talking, lots of experimenting, not working, and then going back to the drawing board. Absolutely. All right, let's go to the lines. Uh, we've got uh, Cola on the line. Hello, Cola. Good afternoon, Nolene. Good uh, afternoon. You are Antoinette. Yes. Hi, I, Antoinette. How are you today? Very, very well. I'm being educated and I'm feeling so proud to be in the presence of such brilliant women. Yes, and I want to say it's so good to see that you really recognize all these great scientists. Yeah, absolutely. But then, you know, a special congratulations to Professor Maureen Kutsia. Yes. That brings back a lot of memories because in 1971 I was one of the first ladies working in Zanin in Dr. Siegfried Anneke Institute. Yeah. And the first insectarium was then built and we were only four staff members. It was wonderful. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't achieve what she did. I only, <laughs> I only got to medical technology. But it's wonderful. And you ask how much did we earn? I earned then 99 rand a month, and that was a lot well, of money. It has now gone up. They are now multi-millionaires, I can assure you. I can tell you that for sure. Thank you so much. You're laughing at me, <laughs> Paul. But you don't do it for the money. It's, it's really about the passion. Uh, am, am I right? Absolutely. If you are in a field like mine, for example, where you are uh, dealing with inequalities and you are dealing with making mm. sure that people are, are attended to you are dealing with different models of mm. governance that make people's lives recognized you are studying local government and you are studying uh, um, gender issues mm. you're actually trying to extend a professional expertise for the benefit of the of the communities that yeah. is what social science is and we benefit at the end we're going to leave it there ladies congratulations thank, thank you. you so much for joining us after the break i'll be chatting to four young future professors <laughs> Welcome back to Three Talk. Joining me now are the professors of the future. They are four young women who spend their days discovering, inventing, and achieving. Please welcome Noreen Vandenberg, Aisha Pando, Ditutu Modungwa, and Tozama Ongoleyo. Did I get your surnames right? Not quite. Not quite. Oh, I apologize. I apologize. Because I did practice. I really did. No Congratulations, mm -hmm. girls. So you, you have uh, received what at the awards? So it's a master fellowship. Yeah, I see it as a promise, as, yeah. as the work that I will do, but obviously some that I have contributed to the world of science. Okay, so and is this the same for, for all of you? What, what did Aisha? Well, mine is a doctoral fellowship. So yeah. it's, uh, I'm nearing the end of my, my PhD. Okay. And it's just recognition of, of that work. Okay, and, and for you? Uh, mine was a, a PhD scholarship. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thanks, Tata's sponsorship. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. And, and you? And also mine is a doctorate a scholarship sponsored by Tata. And, and all you ladies, what is it about the sciences that you love so much, Nari? I love biology, just to know what, how, how things work, how yeah. the way, way God made it. So it's, it's amazing for me. Have to you always it. been interested in the science? Sciences? Yes, I must say. My father stimulated me from a young age. I love biology. I took physiology even. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I knew I wanted to be in, in the medical biological field. Yeah, from a young age. You know, you are probably one of them. I'm sure all of you are going to say the same thing, but you're so fortunate in knowing what you want to do and being passionate about knowing what you want and what you want, want to achieve. For you, Aisha, has it always been the sciences? I think it's, it's just been being curious about things. So I just, I, I've, I'm very curious about why things work the way they work, why things are the way they are. Um, and I go on to Google many, many times a day just to, to find out random facts. So it's about knowing about things. Yeah, so what do you Google? I Google, I'll come across the name of a town and I'll Google it. The other day we were driving to Pretoria and I came across Pro Proclamation Hill. Yeah. And I wanted to know why, why it's called that. So just random things. I just like to know. I like information, I suppose. Yeah. And for, for you? Yeah, uh, it's, 
me excited. Just a comment before then. As I was sitting, waiting to get on the studio, I was just fascinated by all the cameras and thinking how this is much more fascinating than actually being in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, other, the professors but were I, laughing I can't, at me. Do you think, because th this is a creative environment, and, uh, and often, you know, things happen very quickly and you don't have time to think about it. So, you know, you looking at this environment and looking at the cameras and the lights and if, do you think because your, your mind is wired differently that you sit and you analyze every little thing, the carpet, it was made this way <laughs> and the reason, <laughs> I would imagine. Exactly. So this is, is, would this be the kind of environment where you'd be drawn to at any stage? Yes, behind the scenes that is, yeah, behind, <laughs> with the cameras, <laughs> how the three cameras communicate, and how, what's ah, going on, that, see, that's I what is really... So, so your mind is constantly thinking yes. about how things are put together. Yeah, because I'm on the engineering side of things. So, yeah. yeah, are you the kind of person who drove your mom and dad completely mad? Because you used to tear things apart yes, and, and hope that you're going to be able to put them yes, together again. and a lot of experiments in their bathrooms, bending carpets and so forth. <laughs> so I constantly needed to be under so much supervision for that. <laughs> so I can yeah. imagine. Tag but along. Every but look at me now. Look yeah. at me now. I paid it off. Were you, were you also the kind of person who, who did that or, or did it come, your love for science came, came later on? I think it's a series of events. You know, Abraham Lincoln once said, we are influenced by the people we meet and by the books we read. So for me, firstly, it's my parents. When I was young, my father bought MS24 kids. So it was sponsored by All Mutual. So we used yeah. to play it at home. I think that made a major influence. Yeah. And also just people like that you meet, like influential people, you, you become more and more interested in the findings that uh, have been made in South Africa. You know, Christian Bernard, the heart transplant happening in Hodeskia. Yeah. So that, that, that draws, draws me like closer into science world. Okay. And what is the, the things that you guys are working on, on now? Because you've passed your bachelor's uh, stages a, a long time ago. So w what are you working on now? What is the one thing that you're working on? So I'm, I form part of a big group of people who each work in individual aspects of this project. So it's mm. also microbicide development. Yeah. Um, my work is the basic, basic research to identify a, a compound that can be used to inhibit HIV infection mm -hmm. and to, to discover how it's working, where it's binding to the virus, how it's inhibiting the infection. Okay. And then once we have this data, we would like to develop a microbicide with yeah. it. Aisha? Um, my work is in the medical sciences and it's, um, the focus is on hereditary blindness. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the causes at, at the cellular level and at the molecular level. Yeah. And then trying to use our understanding of that to, to develop therapy for the disease or treatment for the disease. Okay. Well, looking forward to, but that's kind of many years. It is many it years. It, it, it takes long to develop these things. And, and as the minister said, there's lots of testing and, you know, to make sure things are safe, to make sure they work, yeah. um, to make sure that they're not things that have been done before. So there is a lot of work that goes into it. I thought it. you were going to make the mistake and say, mummy. <laughs> <laughs> the minister. I've been trained well. Oh, you've been trained very, very well. Did you do it very quickly? Uh, well, uh, my background is mechatronics engineering. And the research I'm working on now is around the area of robotics. And particularly when zooming down into South Africa, how um, we're trying to design and develop robotic systems, especially in the manufacturing industry, that could impact in yeah. productivity and yeah, all yeah. that. Okay. And, and yours? Yeah, yeah. And my work, I'm in CSIR, the bioscience unit, and we're looking at the application of enzyme mm. in order to um, discover novel antibacterial and in order to counter the emerging uh, antibiotic drug resistance. So okay. it's the application of enzyme. Yeah. But the emphasis is on TB, especially right, in that's South the work. Africa. Okay, guys, yeah. let's leave it there. Congratulations, the future professors. Okay. It's finally time to pack away the chunky blankets and your heavy winter wardrobe. But what are the absolute must-haves in your closet this summer? And how can you adapt your wardrobe from drab to fab for the sunny season? We'll find out from the experts tomorrow at three, uh, on 3Talk at 3.30. Until then, have a great evening.